Um, let's get started. Uh, I'm Matt Ahrens. Um, I helped create the ZFS file system uh, back at Sun Microsystems uh, starting in 2001, uh, and now I work for uh, Delphix. So first, um, before we get to the, the details of the talk, I have a few questions for you guys, which may result in you receiving a free, awesome t-shirt that says, that looks just like this. Bunch of uh, FreeBSD-based companies, logos on the back that are using OpenZFS. So who has, these are all applied to using Z ZFS in production on whatever platform is your favorite one, FreeBSD, I assume. Uh, so who has the biggest storage pool that they're, that they're using in production? How many terabytes? Hundreds? 100 terabytes? 127. Yeah? Anybody more than 120? Wow, that's a lot of drives, huh? Uh, congratulations. Do you want a t-shirt or do you already have one? Okay. Would you like a t-shirt? Uh, what size? I have a very few number of larges, so you are in luck. You want extra large will work? All right. So how about for all flash pool? <coughs> Somebody must have what, 10 terabytes of all flash? No? Not too many people do. 60 terabytes of all flash. Think. Can anybody do better either in terms of the number or the uh, reliability of the number? laptop has 400 megabits of flash. All right, so not, not too many all flash pools. T-shirt? What, uh, what size? All right. Medium? Medium work for you? And how about the largest number of file systems or Zvols in a pool? I'm sure somebody has 1,000, right? 1,000 file systems? More than 1,000? No? You're just going to win all of them, and you already have a t-shirt. How about uh, 500? No, people don't keep track of these things. It's so it just works so well. You don't have to worry about how many file systems there are, right? So you don't know. Um, total number of snapshots in a pool? Somebody's got to have like 10,000. What? No, 5,000? 3,000. 3,000. Several hundred thousand. <laughs> wow. Do you want another T-shirt? I know you. you you had, so you had one last time. Um, how about the most number of pools in one system? So this is a little bit of an unusual use case because I think typically people have you know, maybe one or two storage pools, one for booting, one for your data. Anyone using more than that on one system? Three. Ah, gotcha. Cool. Anyone else? More than three? Yeah. Eight. What are you using them for? So the for fall isolation, it sounds like. Yeah. And how many do you have? 40. 40. 40 different storage pools in one system. Wow. Also for fall isolation, or yeah. uh, what size t-shirt? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, what's next? Okay, so who has the most memory? Thank you. Yeah, who has the, who has the biggest memory system that they're using with ZFS? Uh, how, uh, what's that? I have 144. 144. Somebody ha has more? 256. Yeah, 256. Do I hear 512? No. 256? <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody with 512? Yeah, we have 512. You have 512. Anybody with? Anybody with more than 512? Yeah? 512? What, what size t-shirt? Uh, All right. Maybe I scared you guys off of the larges. I do actually have two larges, if you'd prefer. Thanks. Um, and 
who has the biggest L2 arc cache? So the largest cache devices or, or, or most number? I'm guessing ter somebody's got a, a terabyte? No? Terabyte of L2 arc? 500 gigs of L2 arc. Yeah? How many, you have 500 gigs? You have 500 gigs in one drive or you have a bunch of different drives? Four, four SSDs? Cool. What size t-shirt? <coughs> Large? Yeah. All right, cool. So um, now that we're done with the game show part of the presentation, um, if you're really sad that you didn't get a t-shirt, come up to me afterwards. I do have a few more here. Um, so. Uh, First, I wanted to talk about just a little bit of overview. Um, probably most of you are familiar with this, but um, about what is a ZFS storage system. So ZFS is a storage software. It incorporates the functionality of both file systems and volume managers. Um, so that means that uh, we can create a lot of different file systems from a, a lot of different pools. And we do that in a very flexible way, allowing you to create file systems on demand. They use only the amount of space that they're using, and as you free free space from file systems, that space gets released back to the storage pool immediately. So you don't have to statically configure, this file system is going to use this disk, and this other file system is going to use this other disk. You just have a pool of all the disks. The file systems allocate and free space from the pool um, as they need it. Um, we have a transactional object model. So everything is always consistent on disk. You never have to run FSDK uh, because uh, everything is al always consistent. Um, and you can use uh, ZFS f for all sorts of storage systems. So for both files and block devices, exporting them out over an NFS, uh, SMB, uh, iSCSI, Fiber Channel, Samba, all this kind of stuff. Um, and we have end-to-end -end data integrity. So we check some all of the data before writing it to disk. And then after we read it from the disk, we verify the checksum. And all the checksums, checksum, the other checksums below them. So uh, essentially everything in ZFS is a tree, and the checksum verifies everything that's below uh, that point in the tree. Um, so this is called a Merkle tree. Uh, so this allows us to um, detect and actually correct silent data corruption. So all of the metadata in ZFS is stored redundantly with at least two copies, um, in addition to whatever you've configured whatever redundancy you've configured at the storage pool level, like mirroring or RAID-Z. So when we read data from disk, we verify that checksum. If the checksum is bad, then we can go find another good copy of it, read the good copy, and then correct the bad copy. Um, and if there are no good copies, then at least we can tell the application that we don't have this data for you, sorry, rather than just giving you whatever the disk happened to give us um, and letting that silently get corrupted up through your whole application stack. Uh, and lastly, uh, but I think one of the most important things about ZFS is that it's easy to administer. So uh, when we started the ZFS project back in 2001, one of the main goals was just to end the suffering of system administrators. I mean, we saw how hard it was to use file systems and software volume managers uh, together or uh, file systems and uh, fiber channel and you know, storage, uh, you know, big expensive storage boxes um, together. Uh, so we wanted to create an administrative interface that allows uh, system administrators to concisely express their intent. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the ways that we did that is with inheritable properties. So uh, you can easily group things together that logically are similar. So for example, you might have a system with a lot of home directories and then some, some uh, you know, databases or some video files. You can say, all of my home directories should be compressed and then all of my video files should not be compressed, and all my database files should be stored with the 8K record size. Um, this is very easy to do with ZFS property inheritance. And lastly, um, we wanted to create d scalable data structures. So I actually put this under the category of administration rather than uh, explicitly performance, because I think that uh, a lot of the limitations uh, that came from earlier, that, that were existing in earlier um, file systems the main impact is uh, not so much performance because people learn how to work around them, but then all those workarounds uh, become additional things you have to remember every time you're configuring a storage system. So you have to remember, well, 
Uh, I can use this file system, but not if I have a disk that's bigger than a terabyte, because then it gets slow. Or I can use this file system, but as long as I don't put more than you know a couple hundred uh, ent uh, files in each directory, so I have to figure out how to break up my directories. Um, we wanted to create scalable data structures so that no matter how you're using ZFS, the performance is going to be very good. Um, so this is showing uh, where ZFS fits into the software stack. So um, this is all demonstrating kind of what uh, different software components in the kernel. Uh, so at the top, you have requests coming in over uh, NFS maybe, uh, SMB, uh, local file accesses, all that gets funneled through the virtual file system layer, VFS. So in a uh, traditional file system model, the VFS uh, accesses files in the file system. The file system then um, accesses blocks from a block device, either from a volume manager directly or maybe uh, out over iSCSI or uh, fiber channel to an external block man uh, volume manager that's implemented in a very expensive hardware appliance. Um, and then that, uh, in turn, uh, talks blocks to the actual storage. So across this interface, a lot of information gets lost. So for example, uh, the, the, the volume manager doesn't necessarily know what data is being used by the file system and what isn't. It only knows what you've written at some point in time. Um, and you have this isolation where each file system is attached to its own disks. With ZFS, um, <coughs> we basically ZFS subsumes the role of both the file system and the volume manager, as I mentioned. Um, again, we have uh, file operations coming in from the VFS layer, but we can also service uh, block type operations um, for uh, SCSI targets like iSCSI or fiber channel target. So being able to export volumes out um, over, uh, over iSCSI or fiber channel. Um, <coughs> That all comes into ZFS. <coughs> and then we've, set, we've kind of redrawn the boundaries between these software components. So um, the top level of ZFS deals with the uh, uh, operations that are specific to files or volumes. So uh, the volume layer is very simple, but the file layer deals with things like um, file ownership and permissions and file length and directories, things like that. And then uh, these layers talk to the data management unit using simple atomic transactions on objects. So the data management unit provides objects. Objects are kind of like flat files. Um, so the, the POSIX layer can create a transaction that says, okay, I'm renaming this file, so I need to remove the entry from this directory, add the entry to this other directory, and uh, modify the file to say who, where its parent is, for example. Um, then within ZFS, we have this uh, layer between the DMU and the storage pool allocator. And this layer is where uh, we can request blocks to be allocated uh, and written and, f and read and then freed. So the DMU has some piece of data that the, that the user has asked us to write. Um, and we send this data down to the storage pool allocator and we say, okay, great, here's you know, the first, um, the first uh, 128 kilobytes of uh, the file that the user asks us to write. Please write that somewhere to disk or some number of disks, I don't really care. Just you figure it out and then give me a token that I can use to read that back later on. The storage pool layer deals with allocating space on disk for that, compressing that, um, checksumming it, maybe uh, if we're doing mirroring, writing it to two copies or RAID-Z, writing out the parity information. Um, and then tells the DMU, great, here's, here's the location that I wrote on disk. Just whenever you want it back, uh, let me know. The DMU can then read that, and they can also free it by specifying that same uh, block pointer. Cool. Uh, any questions about this? By the way, just if you have questions throughout this, just raise your hand um, or shout out. Um, I think we have plenty of time to take questions uh, throughout the talk. Cool. So. How did we get to this point um, of ZFS having all these features, being available on all these platforms? So as I mentioned, um, we started working on ZFS uh, back in 2001 uh, at Sun Microsystems. Um, and we open sourced the code uh, in 2005. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, 
Powell worked on uh, porting it to FreeBSD, and it was released uh, in FreeBSD 7 uh, back in 2008. So uh, things are going on great. And then um, there is this kind of really concerning event where uh, Oracle acquired uh, Sun Microsystems uh, and stopped contributing source code for ZFS. Uh, so in the community, there's this really big question where, um, because up until this point, almost all of the uh, s contributions and source code changes to uh, ZFS were coming from uh, Sun Microsystems. Um, despite, you know, it was open source, everybody was using the source code, it was on FreeBSD, but the vast majority of the actual um, contributions and code changes were coming from Sun. So when Oracle bought Sun and turned off that task of source code changes, um, <coughs> people were asking, well, what's going to happen? Like, is, is ZFS just going to become some uh, yet another proprietary Oracle technology that is just going to wither and die um, in, the, in the open? Um, so uh, in 2010, in response to that, um, a bunch of people who had formerly worked uh, at Sun uh, formed the Illumos community um, as a replacement for Open Solaris. So uh, the reason that I call this truly open source um, software is because uh, the previous model under Sun was basically that uh, one company controls everything that's happening with, uh, with Open Solaris. Um, but uh, under the uh, Illumos community, it's much more like the FreeBSD community, where uh, there's many different companies. Nobody has uh, you know, any more stake than any other company. Um, everyone's trying to work together to, uh, to make the, the operating system as good as possible. Um, you know, everyone working on an equal footing uh, with you know, a variety of people contributing, not just one company. Um, more recently, uh, ZFS is available now uh, for Linux uh, in the Linux kernel, um, as a Linux kernel module, I should say. Um, and then uh, very recently, in this past, uh, just a year ago, uh, we started the open, the open ZFS community. So the point of open ZFS, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so, uh, and then uh, just this year, uh, open ZFS for Mac OS X has launched. So this is uh, an add-on. Um, from a developer who's ported ZFS uh, to Mac OS X, so you can use it on all of your uh, laptops. So what is the point, uh, any questions? Is it bootable? It is not bootable on Mac OS X. Yet. Yeah, yeah. It's still very early days for the Mac OS X port. Any, any other questions? Okay, cool. So um, what's the point of OpenZFS? So, the goal of OpenZFS is to uh, foster uh, community de development. To, it's a community of developers from all these different platforms, uh, FreeBSD, Illumos, Linux, and Mac OS X. Uh, the, point, the goal of it is to raise awareness, make sure that people know, hey, ZFS is alive and well in the open. It's not just a proprietary Oracle technology. Um, it's actually being used by a lot of companies to create products based on the open source version of ZFS. Um, Secondly, to, to make sure that people who are working on ZFS on each of these different platforms are talking to one another and sharing, uh, sharing code between, say, Linux and FreeBSD, uh, and also to ensure that there's consistent um, feature sets on each of these different platforms um, and you know, good performance on all the platforms. Basically, make sure that all of the, all of the uh, work that's going into making ZFS better is available to as many people as possible on as many platforms as possible. Any questions? Cool. So um, those are all great goals. What have we actually done to try and accomplish them? So uh, like any good open source project, the first thing that we did was create a web page. Uh, it's open-zfs.org. Uh, don't forget the dash. Um, we, and we created a mailing list. So the point of the mailing list is for uh, developers to be able to uh, talk about and review platform independent code changes. So this isn't intended as a replacement for the platform specific mailing lists that are largely used for um, discussion of you know, how does ZFS, uh, how do I, I encounter this some problem, how do I install ZFS, how do I get ZFS running? This, is, this mailing list is primarily for developers, so uh, people actually working with the source code. Um, 
and you'll see that the, you know, the, the focus of the OpenZFS community is largely around um, developers and making sure that developers have the resources that they need um, and uh, are working with other developers from, from other platforms who they might not normally come into contact with. Um, so we want to simplify the development process. And really, I should say here, we want to simplify the ZFS development process um, and make sure that people can get their code changes from one platform to another. And I'll have an example of how we're doing that uh, in, in a minute. Um, so to ensure the quality of ZFS on all the platforms, we're working on creating a cross-platform test suites. So uh, we have a test suite that's been available on uh, Illumos for a long time. Uh, first it was called STF for Solaris Test Framework, now it's called Test Runner. Um, and that's been ported to FreeBSD, but it's not part of the usual workflow of people developing on FreeBSD. So we want to work on making that more available and um, uh, you know, an easier, easier thing to, to run on every platform. Um, we want to reduce the code differences between the platforms so that it's easy to continue porting changes be between the different platforms so that all the patches apply cleanly on all the platforms. Um, so obviously we can't do this 100% uh, because there are differences between platforms. Um, for example, at the VFS layer, uh, where the ZFS file system interfaces with the, the, um, the operating system's um, virtual file system layer and say the, uh, the virtual memory subsystem, there are differences there, but the vast majority of the ZFS code uh, <coughs> is not uh, interfacing with the, the VFS and, and, uh, and uh, virtual memory systems. Most of it is actually platform independent and could be the same on every platform. <coughs> and uh, we're also holding office hours. Um, this is an online event. Um, roughly once a quarter where uh, we'll have an expert in uh, ZFS um, have an online chat over IM and uh, video chat where anybody can call in and just ask questions about what are you working on, how does ZFS work on your platform, um, and so we're trying to get people from all the different platforms um, to participate in this and, uh, and host a office hours. So if you are a ZFS developer, especially from FreeBSD because uh, we have not had someone from FreeBSD yet, um, it would be great to schedule in office hours that you would hold. Um, usually uh, what I do is um, it's kind of like an interview style. So uh, you know, people are a little bit slow to get warmed up and start asking questions. So basically I will ask you questions about what you're working on, uh, what are your favorite things about ZFS, what are you most looking forward to? Um, and then uh, people will, from, the, from the audience will uh, chime in and ask about their favorite uh, pet, pet project or, or pet feature. So um, we know that ZFS is available on all these platforms. Um, and uh, there's a lot of activity across all of the platforms. Um, these numbers are a little bit out of date, but uh, I think they serve to, to demonstrate that you know, we have um, hundreds and hundreds of commits, you know, about 100-ish people actually contributing to ZFS across all of these platforms. And these, uh, you know, the stability and quality and availability of ZFS on these platforms has enabled a lot of software companies, uh, software and hardware companies, I should say, to uh, create products based on open source ZFS. Um, so these include uh, both companies that do kind of traditional um, storage, uh, where they're selling um, either hardware or they, they're on top of other people's hardware, like say, you know, Nexenta. Uh, or IX systems, uh, but also companies that um, that wouldn't be thought of as traditional storage companies that need uh, reliable storage. So, for example, you know, Wheel Systems, they make a, a security product. Um, so, the the primarily thing that they're selling is not storage; it's not a storage solution. But they need to be able to store all the information about the data that passes through um, their uh, you know their VPN type product. Um, and so they choose to use ZFS to do that uh, because it's very reliable, very secure, um, and they know they'll be able to get the data back. Um, oh, so uh, another kind of interesting uh, company that I'd like to mention is Cloudius. So uh, they make a actually new operating system, which is why I didn't put them in one of these buckets, um, called OSV. Uh, it's it's uh, actually written mostly from scratch in C++, which is a certainly a new trend in uh, operating systems. 
Um, but one of the few technologies that they use uh, that they did not write from scratch was uh, ZFS. Um, and, and their operating system is designed for use in the cloud, so it only runs on, on top of other hypervisors. Um, but they still need you know, file systems, networking, et cetera. Um, and, and they're using ZFS for that. Uh, any questions about the great companies who are using OpenZFS in their products? So um, the next section of the talk, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what we've actually done uh, in OpenZFS that makes OpenZFS different from um, and better than uh, ZFS as it was you know, in 2010 when, um, when Oracle uh, essentially forked, uh, the, forked ZFS for their own proprietary version. Um, so questions about kind of uh, open ZFS in general, what we're doing, what, what the goals are? No? Good. Everybody's on board. So uh, one of the first things that we realized when we uh, created open, uh, when, when we uh, realized that there was no longer going to be one company controlling everything that happens with ZFS is that uh, we need some way to coordinate changes that are happening uh, on different, uh, changes that are being made to ZFS by different companies. So uh, one of the most critical things is that we maintain um, on-disk version compatibility of ZFS on every platform, on every distribution. So this is what allows you to take a storage pool that was created on FreeBSD and move it to Linux, or take a storage pool that was created on Illumos and move it to FreeBSD. So in the initial development model, um, as I mentioned, all the changes essentially had to go through Sun. So there was just a linear version number. So, so what that means is that there was ZFS version 20, and then when you had version 21, then, uh, then version 21 knew about everything from version 20, version 19. Everybody agreed what version 21 meant. It meant that you know, we added, uh, say, RAID Z3 support to the on-disk format. Um, in OpenZFS, we created feature flags. So feature flags allows, us, allows the on-disk format to self-describe what features are being used. So uh, this allows me at my company to create an on-disk format change and say, OK, great, I've, I've created something, but it's not version 22, because you might also be developing something. You might think to call it version 22 as well. I created something, and it's called feature flags, um, you know, uh, org.freebsd colon, um, what's, the, what's the good one, background destroy. So this is, allows us to destroy um, file systems in the background rather than having to wait for them. Um, so I can develop that feature. I, can, uh, I don't need to coordinate with anyone while I'm developing it. You can develop your own feature. You don't have to coordinate with anyone while you're developing it. But we can still both contribute our changes to the common uh, OpenZFS code. Cool. And while we were at this, we realized that there's a lot of um, rigidity to the existing um, uh, on disk format descriptiveness. So with feature flags, you can actually describe features that are um, backwards compatible in a read-only fashion. So you can say, OK, I'm creating this new feature, but maybe it's just adding some new fields that need to always be updated, but older software uh, doesn't need to know about them. It, it essentially, it can read it, and it doesn't have to know about the fact that it added some new type of accounting, for example. Um, so this allows you to take a pool that's actually at a newer version uh, that, that, ha that is using newer on-disk features and bring it back to an older release of software <coughs> and still open it. Um, we also added support for, being able to the, for the pool being able to self-describe uh, which features are actually in use versus which features are s simply enabled. So with the old uh, version number, once you upgraded to a new version, that was it. Um, it doesn't matter if you were actually using RAID Z3 or not. Once you've gone to the version that has RAID Z3, you can't take that pool to any older uh, software. Uh, versus with feature flags, um, if you had some equivalent feature uh, that ha added a new type of RAID, um, you could enable that feature. And then it wouldn't be until you actually created uh, a RAID Z4 type uh, device that um, we would mark that feature as being in use. Um, and we actually have the ability for features to become enabled and then go back uh, uh, for features to become in use 
and then to go back to being enabled. So for example, the background destroy feature that I mentioned, um, you can enable background destroy, you destroy a file system, then in the background, uh, we keep track of how far we've gotten with that destroy. Then when the destroy finishes, the feature can go back to simply being enabled, and you can take that pool back to an older system, an older software system that doesn't know about the background destroy. Questions about feature flags? Yes. So uh, the question is about compatibility with Oracle ZFS. So um, Oracle hasn't released any um, information about their on-disk format changes. So uh, if you need compatibility with uh, Oracle, then uh, you should create your pools at version 28, which is the last version uh, that was open sourced uh, from Sun. Um, and that'll allow you to take your pool between Oracle and uh, OpenZFS. Uh, but obviously, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of any of the new on-disk features um, in OpenZFS uh, or you know the new on disk features that um, that are in Oracle ZFS. Do you know if Oracle is actually doing any project development? Yeah, so Oracle is still um, investing pretty heavily in ZFS. Um, they still have a, a you know pretty large team of software developers, um, and and they're pushing the uh, I think mainly the storage appliances, so like the ZFS storage appliance, ZFS backup appliance. Um, so they're definitely still investing in it, and um, you know we would love to uh, coordinate with them to work on you know at least like on disk format compatibility uh, for later versions. Um, but unfortunately, you know their development model so far has been to uh, keep everything completely under wraps. Uh, well, no <laughs> leaks don't really help us uh, if 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 we can't legally use that um, you know that information. So, any other questions? So um, actually, this is kind of interesting because, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, if you use uh, OpenZFS and you need to take those storage pools to uh, Oracle ZFS, um, then you wouldn't be able to use any of the new um, on-disk format features. But there's, we've actually done a lot of work in ZFS that doesn't impact I in OpenZFS that doesn't impact the on-disk format at all, and this is an example of that. So. Um, in, uh, in older ZFS, um, well, uh, let, me, let me back up a moment. There's this inherent problem um, of storage systems, which is that if the application wants to write data more quickly than the storage system, the storage hardware can absorb those writes, then at some point, the file system has to delay those, uh, those write operations. So in a, um, a very simple file system, this might be done for example, by um, taking each write from the application and immediately writing it to disk and waiting for that disk write to complete before letting the application continue. Um, in ZFS, if the, if the application doesn't request, explicitly request that um, the data is on disk uh, immediately, then we will buffer those writes in memory and then flush them out at a later point in time. So this gives much, much better performance for those writes than uh, if we were do to do every write synchronously. But if we do this, then there's a limit to how much, uh, how, how many of these writes we can buffer in memory because we don't have unlimited amounts of memory. Um, so at some point we have to delay the writes. Um, and uh, in uh, older ZFS, uh, the way that this was done was uh, essentially we, if we can take this, if we can buffer this much writes, we start writing, we start filling up the buffer, we let the application go really quickly, everything's great. Then when you hit the limit, everybody stop. So all application threads that are coming to do writes um, have to block until we've flushed out that entire uh, amount of, of dirty data. So uh, the end result is that uh, everything goes blindingly fast until you just slam into that brick wall and all operations stop. So um, let's, in terms of performance, uh, this is very bad for interactive performance, obviously, because you know, you're running long, everything's great, then you, you know, just, Everything stops. So, uh, looking at, we wanted to quantify, you know, how this impact. <clears throat> so this is a histogram showing um, how many, op uh, showing the speed of each operation. So we see that um, the vast, vast majority of all the operations complete very, very quickly. Um, you know, less than uh, just in a matter of microseconds. 
Um, and, and this is a, a log, log, log graph. So this is way, way, way more than, than this, keep in mind. Um, so everything's great. And then, but then we see that there's you know, hundreds of these operations that are taking seconds to complete. Basically, what that means is we're waiting for several seconds for anything to make progress. Um, so we're stuck out here. And so we see that the outliers um, are taking like 10 seconds or more. So the outliers here uh, are the operations. Basically, we're defining that as 99.9% um, .9 of all the operations completed in less than 10 seconds, which is really not great. Um, so in OpenZFS, um, we implemented a, a smoother um, uh, write throttling. So basically, as we fill up that amount, that buffer of dirty data, um, we say, okay, great, everything can go fast, everything can go fast, everything's great. Well, then once we start getting close to being full, then we delay each operation just a little bit. And then as we get full, more and more full, we delay it a little bit more and a little bit more. So the, um, depending on the number of threads and the uh, frequency of the requests, uh, we'll reach kind of a natural uh, uh, self-balancing amount of delay for each operation. So this is much fairer in that uh, we penalize every operation just a tiny bit, rather than penalizing um, few a few operations you know, to the extreme. Um, so the orange line shows the, a histogram of the write latencies uh, under the new smoother write uh, latency algorithms, the new write throttle. Um, and so here we can see that you know, the outliers are much, much smaller. So we completed 99.9% .9 of the operations in less than 30 milliseconds. Um, so this is really great for um, consistency. You know, the most important, one of the most important things with storage is um, consistent performance, uh, even more so than um, ultimate, uh, uh, you know, ultimate bandwidth. Um, although in this case, uh, we, were, we actually also increased the uh, ultimate speed from uh, 5,600 um, IOPS to 5,900 IOPS. Uh, the tests that I did here were on uh, Illumos, but uh, this, c this change is available on uh, FreeBSD and Linux and as well. Is that a, a efficiency in the scheduling of the I.O. of the underlying on less layers or on um, In terms of the, the, uh, the improvement in IOPS or the... Well, I, there's a reason you need to do it in the first place. I mean, there's this big tail that says uh, Illumos is uh, scheduler produces, produces such crazy results, or is that... This is all ZFS. So this is all inside ZFS that, that these delays are going on. Um, so th this, is not a, um, but this is not like an I.O. scheduling issue. Um, it's uh, essentially um, as uh, operations come in, like you know, the application does a write, we get like a VOP read, uh, we get like a VOP write, and then we have to figure out like, okay, great, I can copy your data into the kernel, this address space and buffer that. Um, but I, I can only do that for so long until I run out of memory. So it's ZFS that's worrying about, uh, that has to worry about, like, when do I delay that, uh, that writer? So this, this isn't until it pushes it to the device side. Exactly, okay. exactly. Thank you. Sorry. Any other questions? Um, yes, I'm pretty sure this is, uh, anybody know for sure? I'm pretty sure that this is in FreeBSD 10 release. Um, we did this quite a while ago. And if you're interested in some more details about how this is implemented, um, my colleague Adam Leventhal wrote a couple of blog posts on both the uh, original right throttle and this new uh, right throttle. So another cool thing that we have in OpenZFS is LZ4 compression. So um, the, the previous def uh, best compression algor algorithm was LZJB. Um, so ZFS has built-in compression. Um, we can take each block, maybe it's a 128K block, and compress that down um, depending on the type of data. You, know, you often see like two to one-ish compression. Um, but uh, that compression uh, has some cost, right? It takes some CPU to uh, do that compression. So um, in OpenZFS, uh, we have the new support for new compression algorithm, LZ4. Uh, LZ4 which is much faster, especially uh, in terms of uh, decompression. 
So uh, the red, red bars here are um, LZ4. Um, so we can see that compared to LZJB, uh, the previous default decompression is almost twice as fast. So in practice, what this means is that on the vast majority of workloads, um, you can turn on LZJB with, and there will be basically no performance uh, degradation. In fact, for, for a lot of workloads, performance gets better because the amount of data that we're reading and writing is less because it's compressed. Um, so, and, and, um, and basically LZ4 is better in all respects in that uh, compression and decompression speeds are faster um, and also it compresses a little bit smaller than uh, LZJB did. Uh, any questions about this? <coughs> Um, it will be the default at some point. We were actually just discussing that at the, at the BOF yesterday. Um, I think it would definitely make sense to make this the, the default rather than LZJB. Cool. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some work in progress. Um, so those are two great features that are in Open, OpenZFS today. Um, but uh, what, what's coming in the future? So one of the things that we're working on uh, is uh, related to ZFS send and receive. So um, how much time do I have? All right, just a little bit. So send and receive um, is a ZFS feature. It's used often for remote replication. It allows you to uh, serialize the contents of a snapshot and send it to, to another system and um, restore it there. And it, it, the, the most um, important piece of ZFS send and receive is that you can do incremental sends. So you can send the incremental changes from one snapshot to another snapshot over to remote systems. So this is kind of like rsync, but it's much, much more efficient uh, because it uses the internal ZFS data structures to know uh, what blocks have changed. So the whole uh, ZFS send operation uh, only takes time proportional to the amount of data that was actually changed. Rather than uh, like uh, with rsync, uh, it needs to examine every file, whether it was changed or not. And then if the file was changed, it needs to examine every block of that file to, to determine if the block is different in the new versus, uh, in the local versus remote system. Um, so this is, so send and receive is great. Um, and uh, one cool thing about OpenZFS uh, that is not in um, Solaris ZFS is that we have uh, progress monitoring. So when you do the, the ZFS send, um, it estimates how much, uh, how big the send stream is going to be, um, and then can report uh, periodically how much progress has been made so that you know when you start that send uh, and you come back the next morning, it's still running, is it almost done? Or, is, or do I still have another 24 hours to wait? But uh, there is this uh, problem, which is that if for any reason the uh, send and receive processes are interrupted, maybe um, when the system reboots or the network connectivity is lost, then we have to restart this send process from the very beginning. So if you are sending a terabyte of data and you're almost done and then the network dies, then you have to restart from the very beginning and send that whole you know, 0.9 terabytes again. Um, so uh, we're working on a solution to this uh, where the receiver will remember how much data has already been received and then we can communicate that back to the sending system so that the sender can resume from exactly that point. So if we lose network connectivity, you can just restart the send. It'll restart from exactly where it left off and uh, resume that uh, operation. Any questions about this? Hopefully, uh, this will be in FreeBSD by the end of the year. <laughs> I know we, we've been talking about this for quite a while. So I mentioned um, a little bit earlier the goal of uh, making it easier to uh, share um, ZFS enhancements uh, between different platforms. So uh, the main way that we're going to make this easier is uh, by creating a platform independent code repository for OpenZFS. So um, let me actually go to the diagram. So um, the current kind of uh, de facto situation is that um, changes are made uh, on all different platforms, uh, but the only way that changes typically get uh, moved between platforms is from Illumos to Linux and FreeBSD, and then from Linux to Mac OS X. So if some uh, fix is made on Mac OS X, 
there's, uh, typically those changes don't make their ways into FreeBSD, for example. Um, and the, the reason for that is largely because, um, you know, in order for, uh, say, macOS to contribute changes to FreeBSD, uh, they would need to, um, you know, those developers would need to have a FreeBSD system. They need to know about the FreeBSD procedures, uh, you know, how to submit patches, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, they might not necessarily care about FreeBSD. They just care about their platform. So we want to make it as easy as possible for them to share those, those changes um, from you know, Mac OS to FreeBSD and likewise from all these other, uh, between all these other platforms. So uh, the, the goal is that um, we would still be able to um, inject changes, so make changes on any platform in any of these code repositories, but um, each platform would be able to um, push their changes into OpenZFS um, and then pull, those cha pull changes from other platforms from OpenZFS uh, down into their platform. So um, the uh, way that this will be better than using uh, this model is that we'll be able to actually test the OpenZFS code on any platform and have a reasonable, uh, 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 reasonable expectation that it'll, it will work on every platform. Um, so we'll t be able to test this OpenZFS code uh, in userLAM as a regular user process on any of these platforms. Um, uh, so in other words, you won't have to, if you want to get your changes from FreeBSD into Illumos, you won't have to install an Illumos system and understand the Illumos development model and submit your changes. You'll just have to um, understand the OpenZFS development model, which will be much simpler, um, and it will be testable on, uh, on FreeBSD platform. Uh, questions about this? Yes. Uh, what's the size of the operating system that you depend on for things? Yeah, so relative, uh, especially relative to um, like the whole ZFS. So um, actually, I have a little point on this. So um, because we want to test this code uh, on any platform. Um, we can only, uh, we're only gonna include code that we can test in user land. So um, in practice, it's around 80 to 90% of the code um, we think we'll be able to include uh, off the bat um, in, uh, in the OpenZFS repo. Um, so it's basically everything except for, um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned here, the ZPL, the POSIX layer, and the VDEV disk. So the VDEV disk is very small. The POSIX layer is, um, substantial in size, but uh, still like the vast minority of the total ZFS code. So if I had to guess, I think it's probably, uh, the whole ZFS code is around, uh, let's say 150,000 lines of code. Um, the ZPL is probably less than 20,000 lines of that. Cool. About 10 minutes, cool. Great. So. Um, we're also working on a whole bunch of other new features, um, and uh, many of them, the ones in green here, have actually already been implemented, uh, and a few of them integrated. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute, because um, I don't, we, we would, I don't have time to explain every single one of these, so I'll take questions on it in a moment. So um, the last thing that I wanted to leave you with is how to get involved with, uh, with OpenZFS. So first of all, if you're making a product based on OpenZFS, um, let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about you know, how, how ZFS is helping your company. Um, and uh, we'd love to get your logo on our website with a little description of um, what your product is and, how, uh, and, and why you chose ZFS. Um, and get your logo on the back of our t-shirts that we give out. Um, if you're a user or, or a sysadmin, um, please help us spread the word about the fact that uh, open source ZFS is alive and well. We're doing lots of great work to um, enhance it and make it better for you every day. Um, and if you're if you're working with the code base, um, please join the developer mailing list. Um, and uh, we're just announcing this week the second annual OpenZFS Developer Summit. It'll be this November in San Francisco. Um, and uh, we're accepting talk proposals now uh, that will be due uh, in September. Um, also on the mailing list, uh, it's a great place to get feedback on code changes or if you have questions about how the ZFS code works. Um, 
the OpenZFS mailing list uh, has uh, developers from all different platforms, all different kinds of expertise. Um, so that's a great place to interact with those other developers. Cool. So we have, uh, I think, about a little less than 10 minutes. Um, and I cannot get through every single one of these. So um, are there any particular items that you see here that you might like to know more about? Otherwise, I'm just going to pick ones that I think are cool and start telling you about them. No? Yes. Yes, device removal. So um, this is a project that uh, I'm actually going to be starting to work on uh, very soon. Um, so uh, <coughs> some of you may recall the mythical BP rewrite project from the Open Solaris days, um, which uh, the goal of which was to be able to change any, uh, basically to change any on-disk data in any arbitrary way. So move it from one place to another, compress it after the fact, you know, enable encryption on it, or you know, whatever you want. So um, that, that, uh, that method turned out to be extremely complicated um, and uh, very low performance. So, uh, and I should mention, uh, the, the, the connection here is that uh, this BP rewrite project um, would, have saw, would have enabled device removal, but uh, it was never really completed um, because of those things that I mentioned. Um, so the device removal uh, project that we're going to be working on now takes a little bit of a different approach. It's focused just on device removal, not on being able to solve all problems for all people. Um, and uh, so the way that we're going to implement it is uh, more like a, we call it an indirect, indirect VDEV. So when you want to remove that device, uh, rather than changing all of the pointers, all the block pointers that reference it, we will um, take the data that's in that device, move it into the other disks, but keep track of the mapping from the old locations uh, in, the v in the device that's being removed to the new locations uh, on the remaining devices. Um, so uh, the performance is going to be better um, and, uh, wh while we're doing this, and the um, impact to, the to performance after the fact we think can be pretty minimal. Um, given you know some tricks that we can play there, um, and this is something that uh, will probably be like in beta by the end of the year, I'm guessing. Yes. Uh, um, I don't know of anyone working on that. Um, I think uh, at every conference I've been to, at least two or three people have asked me about um, ZFS native encryption, um, but uh, no one that I know of is working on it. So this is a great, uh, I think that this would be a great area for um, someone to contribute. Um, uh, the, the way that encryption was implemented um, at Oracle, uh, I think is perha perhaps unnecessarily complicated. So um, I think that going feature for feature um, you know, going for a feature parity exactly with the Oracle encryption um, might not be the best goal, um, but something like a whole disk, uh, you know, whole pool encryption um, that's native to ZFS, uh, I think would be a, a pretty easily implementable thing. Um, the actual impact on ZFS would be uh, fairly minimal. I think that the, the main complication there is uh, key management, um, which is an area that I'm not really familiar with. So uh, this is something where you know, somebody who's more familiar with the encryption techniques and key management um, uh, probably needs to take the, take the helm there. Uh, but I'd definitely be more than willing to help, um, help figure out how to integrate that with ZFS.
So I think. Yeah. Question. Some platform has analyzes tools other than standard left right iterations. For example, Oracle has SQL. Some tools like this. So, not really. Um, so we kind of see. Uh, it, like, uh, so Fishworks is the team that created the ZFS storage appliance at Sun Microsystems. Um, it has a really cool graphical user interface that allows you to, um, it, it basically wraps around dtrace and, um, uh, and uh, case stats to show you graphically like what's happening with the system and, and to be able to drill down on like, okay, I see these are the, this is the latency of the IOPS, then let me drill down on things that are just for this file system or just from this other host, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, and um, like, uh, I, I think that it would be great to implement something similar like that in open source, um, but uh, just like at Fishworks, I don't think that, that, that it would necessarily be part of core ZFS. It would be part of something built on top of it. Um, I don't know of anyone doing exactly that. Um, I know, you know, there's a lot of, uh, companies that are making storage appliances, uh, you know, like FreeNAS, Nexenta, I imagine that they have, they have similar kinds of things. I haven't seen anything as featureful, uh, as rich as the Fishworks um, analytics, um, but I think that that would be a good place for that innovation to happen. Yes. I believe so, but I'm not 100% certain on that. I'm pretty sure that it's also licensed under the CDDL, um, but I'm not 100% sure. The man pages definitely are, um, but like say the ZFS admin guide, uh, I'm not sure about that. If you're starting to diverge enough, because right now it seems like you always end up at Oracle, yeah. but you're diverging enough now where you don't want to be going there, do you want to rewrite it all from scratch? Or yeah, to so I think this is a case where like, the FreeBSD handbook chapter on ZFS is like a great starting point. And um, we need to, like we can combine efforts of the, on, that are happening on all the different platforms. As long as we keep ZFS kind of roughly the same, um, we'll be able to get a lot more people working on that. Yeah, so um, you actually, uh, ZFS has always supported um, online uh, addition of space to the storage pool. So, you know, uh, if, you have, um, if you have two disks, say two disks in a mirror, you can add another two disks in a mirror. And that happens all online while the system is running. You don't even need any downtime. Um, the, the one thing that people often ask for, which is not supported, is like, what if I have, you know, my home system and I have five disks and I have a RAID RAID Z of those five disks, can I just add one more? Um, that, uh, we, that ZFS doesn't support that. Yeah, okay. um, well, you can do that, you just need to uh, I mean, you could jump through a lot of, lot of hoops to. Yeah, but that's not what you want. Yeah, so you would want to maintain yeah. the exact. Yeah, you want to maintain the parity, but you, you need to rearrange all the data to make that happen. Um, so there's no way to do that uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also, I mean, realistically, I understand it's going to take a little bit of technology. Like, if you want to raise that to do, you're probably going to have to do things in pairs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, yeah. unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I'll be here for a, f a few minutes until the next speaker comes and kicks me out. Um, so thanks so much for your interest in OpenZFS. And if you didn't get a t-shirt and you'd really like one, please come see me. I have a few more left. <laughs>